Welcome to the Center for Global Development. As the COVID pandemic has been spreading around the world, every country has been trying to combat it through a mixture of uh, policy measures, some financing to try and ease the burden, and uh, with more or less success. So it's not too early to begin to learn some of the lessons uh, across countries, what works, uh, what doesn't work so well, under what circumstances do policy measures work. And today we have the opportunity uh, to drill down a little bit uh, into the experience of Pakistan, a country of 200 uh, million uh, people, where uh, after the first uh, three months, when the uh, spread of the pandemic uh, uh, followed more or less the pattern you would see in many other countries, uh, since uh, June, there's been a turnaround. And uh, uh, today, the numbers, as they're reported, are... Uh, are a fraction of what they were then and much lower than they are in other countries. So what lies behind these numbers? Uh, how reliable are they? How sustainable is the uh, improvement that's been seen in the last few weeks? Uh, as we've just seen in Europe, uh, in many countries after a similar improvement, Again, you see a, a resurgence uh, of the uh, spread of the virus uh, and people beginning to worry about a second lockdown uh, in many countries. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, panel to help us uh, understand these uh, issues. Three of the leading policymakers from Pakistan who have been uh, uh, leading on different aspects of the response uh, to COVID. Uh, Asad Umar, who is the Federal Minister uh, for Planning, but who has also been uh, coordinating the the government's response to COVID. Asad, welcome. Uh, great to have you. Uh, Sanya Nishtar, uh, who has uh, the title of Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on Poverty Reduction and uh, uh, and Social Safety Nets, and, and who's really uh, been also uh, leading the scaling up, the impressive scaling up of uh, social protection through the use of technology and also use of technology in trying to pinpoint uh, ways in which the spread of the pandemic itself can be controlled. And uh, Reza Bakar, uh, Reza Bakar is the governor of the Central Bank of uh, Pakistan and uh, uh, He's been worrying a lot about the uh, economic consequences of this uh, crisis and, and how to manage uh, that in terms of uh, financial market stability, in terms of uh, the uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, situation, in terms of the macro consequences, and, and uh, also dealing with international institutions uh, in that context. So, so they will be able to give us a very nice perspective of what's been happening and, uh, and also what's keeping them uh, awake at night now? What, what are they worrying about? And then we have uh, two colleagues from CGD uh, who have been looking at uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and the response to it across countries. Calypso Chokidu, who's uh, head of our global health work, has uh, published a lot recently on uh, both the epidemiological dimensions of uh, the COVID pandemic, but also looking at the uh, variation across countries in the response and perhaps some of the uh, unintended consequences of focusing on COVID in terms of what's been happening to health indicators more broadly. And uh, Alan Gelb, uh, uh, who's been recently focused a lot on digital ID systems and how they can help to improve the interface between governments and people, uh, well, the COVID pandemic has sort of uh, brought that very much to the front because uh, many countries have been looking at uh, scaling up systems in that way. So what we thought we would do in the hour we have uh, is to start off by asking our panelists from Pakistan to take five minutes apiece and, and give us a little bit their perspective and then have Calypso and, and Alan uh, perhaps raise any questions from an international dimension, and then I hope we'll have a, a good conversation to drill down uh, in this. I should note before 
turning to our panelists that we are doing this uh, event in association with the Consortium for Development Policy Research in Pakistan. And I want to thank them and uh, welcome them to this as well. So, uh, so this is, Mary, I turn to you first, uh, perhaps to give us a little bit your overall take on, you know, what, how do you see what worked, what, did, what dimensions of the response were most effective? Are there any lessons that you would like to share for other countries? And, and what are the things where you're still worrying about uh, uh, effectiveness and next steps? You're on mute, Asad. Now can you hear me? Right. Yes. Now we can. Okay. I, I, I thought this was a case of yet again the third world being gagged by the US. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good evening or good morning to, <laughs> depending on where you are. Uh, thank, thanks for the invitation, Masood. I'll just uh, in five minutes try and go through uh, an overview of how we dealt with the with the crisis and what are the steps that we took. I'm not sure if there is learning from for anybody else in that or not, but, uh, but at least uh, I'll share with you uh, the thought process that we went through and uh, the decisions that we took. So I would say if I was to analyze the Pakistani response to the crisis, the beginning uh, was a very, very clear-cut position taken by the Prime Minister that we have to take decisions based on balancing the need to protect both lives and livelihoods. And uh, back in uh, early to middle of March, that was not a popular position to take because uh, people used to argue that there is no trade-off and you should focus purely on, on uh, the health aspect of the pandemic and that would also give you the best long-term economic returns. Uh, we took a different view and as I said, the PM was very, very clear about that and the reason for that used to be very simple. Everybody was talking about shut down Pakistan for two weeks, shut it down for four weeks. And a simple question used to be, okay, so what will happen after two weeks or what will happen after four weeks? Uh, will the virus go away? And if not, then th that's not a game plan. Uh, keeping your fingers crossed and hope for the best is not a game plan. Uh, so what was done uh, in order to uh, both formulate and more importantly, as those who know Pakistan, implement, implementing policy has always been the biggest challenge. And the decision that was taken at that point in time was uh, that we needed a national cohesive effort. Uh, so a platform was created. It was called the National uh, Coordination uh, Center, and it was headed by the prime minister himself. All the provincial chief ministers were a part of it. Several of the federal ministers were part of it. And then a couple of weeks, this is middle of March, end of March, there was a decision that to operationalize the decision making, we needed an operational platform and a national command and operation center was set up. Uh, which I chaired, which had a military uh, component to it, civilian federal agencies, provincial agencies. And we worked round the clock essentially for four or five months and uh, used to meet uh, formal meetings every morning chaired by myself uh, over this period. Uh, when we looked around, uh, we thought that the best global practice that we could find uh, was what had been done in South Korea. And that's by now the famous... Uh, testing, tracking, quarantine strategy. Uh, we followed that. Uh, in order to make that happen, uh, there were two different elements to it. One was creating an administrative structure, uh, which started from the NCOC and went down to the grassroots level across Pakistan. There were thousands of people from both the health departments, the provincial health departments, and well as the administrative side of the provincial governments which are involved in this. And as I said, all the way going down to the uh, grassroots. The second element of it was use of technology. Uh, fairly sophisticated technology got used, uh, which allowed us to do two things uh, for the strategy. One was the ability to track the contacts of those uh, who were tested positive. Uh, and the second thing was that then taking that data of index persons as, as they're referred to and mapping it onto population centers uh, using geotagging, we were able to identify hotspots. So what we did was uh, we were able to come up with a strategy uh, where I remember in uh, middle of June, we were locking down 5% of the population of the country 
And in doing that, we were able to uh, contain 43% of the total active cases in the country. Uh, so with minimizing, while minimizing economic destruction, uh, we were able to make a significant dent in the, uh, in the growth of the, uh, of, the crack of the virus and it spread. And as a result, our uh, R-naught values, which in late May uh, were above two, uh, by the end of June had come down below one, and that's the decline, and that, that was followed by the decline in the numbers that uh, Masood, you were referring to. Uh, that uh, process has continued to be fine-tuned. Uh, we now have contact tracing numbers, a uh, national average for each index person. We are now being able to uh, identify and then uh, contact and, and test, and if need be, isolate 15 people. Uh, that's uh, those are actually better than the South Korean numbers which are there in uh, in early March. So they they they're world class numbers, and I explained to you the methodology. Similarly, the targeted lockdowns or the hotspot based lockdowns, as we uh, as I referred to, were initially broad lockdowns. Then they were made more specific. The current uh, phase that we are going through, we call them micro SLDs, uh, micro uh, smart lockdown. What's the bottom line result right now? Uh, starting from the middle of August to where we are right now, our positivity ratios are below 2%, which had peaked at 22% in the middle of June. So they're down by a factor of more than 10. Our mortality numbers, which had peaked at 124 daily deaths uh, in the middle of June, have been for the last five weeks in single digits on a, on a daily basis. So mortality is less than 10, 10 persons per day uh, over the last uh, uh, five weeks. And uh, right next to us, of course, uh, is India, which is uh, north of a thousand uh, people dying of COVID on a daily basis. I just took out some data last six weeks. Uh, the per capita mortality numbers in this period, in this last six week period in Bangladesh are five and a half times higher than Pakistan. In India are 17, 17 times higher than Pakistan. And in Iran, which is just west of Pakistan, our west neighbor, uh, neighbor to the west, it's 46 times higher than Pakistan. So Pakistan is like literally in a bubble in this particular area. All the other numbers that we have been tracking, hospitalizations, uh, uh, people on uh, oxygen, uh, people on vents, etc., all show the same trends. Uh, what, do I, uh, what do I worry about? As somebody was asking me the other day, uh, my job is to worry. So, so I constantly find new reasons to worry. Uh, the next big thing, and it's actually the last big thing in terms of opening up the country, is the school opening. We're doing it in three phases. Uh, we opened the higher schools uh, last week. We're opening the middle schools this week. Uh, and the following week, if everything continues to go on track, we open the primary schools. And uh, between these, uh, between these uh, three steps, we will be sending more than 50 million children back into school. There are 300,000 schools in Pakistan. There are 2 million teachers. So this is an, obviously a, a massive thing which is uh, happening. Uh, in, in the end, uh, the last thing, uh, some there was a question, Masood, you had asked about the uh, role of technology. I already talk, talked to you about technology that we identified or used for contact tracing and modeling. Uh, there was also three different groups that we were using for forecasting where the disease was headed. Uh, we also were able to develop with, for Pakistan. Those who are not familiar with Pakistan may not think it's a great thing. Uh, but the ability right now, we've got 750 or so hospitals in Pakistan who are dealing with COVID patients. And I can give you live data about how many beds are occupied, how many went and so on and so forth on a live basis. That's a big development. And then we've created an app so that any citizen could just download that app and you would know where your nearest hospital is, where a bed is available and where uh, facilities were avail available. Uh, we also put in uh, place a software specifically for the incoming air travelers and pass track is what we call it. Uh, telehealth and tele-education were extensively used because uh, you had shut down, mobility had been reduced and uh, schools were closed. Uh, and uh, all of this uh, uh, was backed in many cases by the use of artificial intelligence also. For example, the uh, SOP compliance monitoring that we have been using was both administrative and technology based. So you take videos from all the uh, smart city, the safe city, cameras uh, and, and even the news uh, uh, coverage that you would get. And then there was a program at the back of it, which is run through artificial intelligence, which would give us the percentage compliance with of SOPs in different parts of the country. So technology played a very, very significant role in, in this whole thing. So I'll, I'll stop there with my opening comments. 
Thank you very much. So, so lots of stuff there. We'll come back to it. Uh, I want to turn to uh, Sanya Nishtar and Sanya. So uh, you know, we technology and its role. Uh, good starting point also in the scaling up effort on the SAS program that you've been heading. I think I also, given your medical background, want to get a little bit your sense of what do you see as any collateral damage of this in terms of other. Uh, health outcomes and health indicators, which is something that we worry a lot about in many country cases. Uh, well, thank you for that question. Um, of course, our energies were all focused on uh, addressing this issue. And uh, for quite some time, the hospitals were focused on grappling with COVID and um, our outpatients departments were closed for quite some time. Uh, so clearly there must have been um, uh, some kind of a collateral negative impact we are, which we are currently uh, assessing. Uh, but, but coming to the other side of your question, um, as uh, Asadomar has just outlined, um, extraordinary measures were put in place. And as a result of that, we saw uh, an early decline of disease. Um, but as he himself mentioned, uh, it was a very tough call uh, during the initial phases of the pandemic because um, it was lives versus livelihoods. And the government uh, had to tread a very fine line. And I think in hindsight that the Prime Minister navigated the situation extremely well. His leadership was critical to where we are today. And I think that the, that the NCOC played a remarkable role with the daily oversight uh, that, that it exercised over the entire process. Uh, I was responsible for, uh, for the social protection aspect of this, uh, which was as critical as the health aspect. Um, the reason why that was the case was because uh, the microanalysis of our labor force survey showed us that there are 24 million breadwinners in the country who either work as daily wage workers or have peace rate remuneration, or they are self-employed in Pakistan's very large informal economy. 24 million breadwinners. When you multiply this with the family size, you're looking at northwards of uh, about 160 million individuals. Uh, that's a very huge population. That's two thirds of the country's population. Uh, and we actually saw, uh, you know, the stress was actually palpable on the streets. Uh, you know very well that Pakistan has this amazing culture of giving. And a lot of our friends and colleagues would tell us that we've filled up our car cars with rations and we want to go out and distribute. But when we go, there are throngs of people because all the daily wage workers were stranded in major cosmopolitan cities, the inter district, the intercity traffic, the interprovincial uh, traffic was, was uh, you know, we, we couldn't allow that to, um, uh, to operate as normally. So there were these millions of daily wage workers stranded in major cities away from their family, not having daily wages, dependent on handouts and, uh, and, and the situation was extremely tense. So about two, two weeks into the lockdown, our, our cities were, our major cities were worse, virtually at the, uh, at, at the verge of civil unrest. Uh, so the government preempted that and as part of the 1.2 trillion package, rupees package that uh, our prime minister announced, uh, there were initially 144 billion rupees earmarked for uh, for SAS emergency cash, and it was subsequently increased to 200 uh, billion, which is about 100 uh, 1.25 billion dollars. The mandate that was given to us was to support uh, 16.9 million families and to give them su a subsistence allowance of uh, 75 dollars each to each family. And the, and the thinking at that time was that hopefully this will tide them over a couple of months and by then we would have uh, controlled the disease spread. Uh, we were fortunate because over the last one year we had been actively focused on developing the digital backbone to run a massive SARS program. 
Uh, and there were three things in particular that we had developed over the last one year, which we brought into play uh, during, this, during this period. One of them was a biometric payment system. We had started the procurement in January 2019 and in October 2019, it had come to fruition. We had brought on board two commercial banks uh, and the system that we had deployed was end-to-end -end, uh, biometrically enabled for payments. Now that was one, one asset that we had in our hand. The other one was a uh, SMS-based request seeking mechanism that we had, and we had conducted extensive exercises you know, war, war gaming exercises of how that would play out, how the SMS would hit our databases, uh, what kind of messages would trigger, what would be the pros and cons. So all through last summer in 2019, we had been doing these blackboard exercises, war game exercises, practical exercises of this. And the third um, capability was actually a um, uh, data analytics mechanism. As you know, Pakistan, uh, every citizen has a unique identification number. That number is tied to our immigration uh, database. It's tied to the Federal Bureau of Revenue. It's tied to uh, your credit history. It's tied to your uh, employment status, to your ownership of cards and so on and so forth. And because in our database registration system, we can identify families and an individual belonging to a family, what we actually conceptualized was, uh, 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 was this mechanism uh, of, of mass assistance pulling a thread through all these three capabilities. And actually the data analytics mechanism we had tested last December as well, when we had exited 0.8 million people from Pakistan's existing social protection lists, which were completely non-deserving. So we pulled a thread through these three systems, and the idea was that we would adopt a hybrid type targeting approach. We would combine emergency assistance for the known vulnerable, but we would open the system to demand-based support for the new poor. So we sought requests through an, through, on, an, uh, uh, on an SMS short code. So uh, all the cabinet members got together and widely advertised an, an SMS short code all over the country. So it was 8171. Everybody was asked to send their identity card numbers on 8171 uh, if they needed assistance. And, and the entire cabinet, the entire government machinery got mobilized on the ground, widely disseminated this message. Once we received this huge repository of SMS messages, and we received 139 million SMSs during that window of period for which this, um, during which the window was open, and of those 66 million were unique. 66 million, that's a huge number. Uh, and then we employed data analytics to enable eleg eligibility ascertainment uh, using wealth proxies and existing survey data. And, uh, and quite a sophisticated mechanism was developed of how those identity card numbers would hit different databases, uh, how they would uh, dip into the government's employment databases, pick the spouses from there, uh, how it would go into the FBR database, how it would hit the immigration database. And according to predefined algorithms and protocols and approved policies, which were, which were approved by at the board level, at the, at the economic coordination subcommittee of the cabinet level, at the cabinet level, according to predetermined protocols and procedures, there were these messages that were triggered across a timeline to inform people where, whether they were eligible or whether they were, they were ineligible. And then once we had this mass of individuals that we identified as eligible, uh, we sent those identity card numbers to, uh, to our partner banks. They did the know your customer procedures on those. And then uh, payment was, uh, was um, uh, authorized and, and we actually had to make payments, we cascaded payments. Uh, and we took the Na National Command and Control Center fully on board. They would help us to convene uh, the chief ministers and the chief secretaries and uh, inform them about what was coming their way. So in each union council, we would send a certain number of SMS messages saying, okay, today is your turn to collect the, uh, 
payments. This is where you go. This is how you uh, co collect your payments. Uh, and this massive operation where we were able to give money to half the people in the country, half the people in this fifth largest country in the world, uh, required this huge coordination. And this huge coordination was done during a period, during a very difficult period when the country was during a lockdown, uh, when there was difficulty moving huge amounts of cash on the ground, when uh, when uh, COVID-related precautions were a real challenge, so uh, the, the long queues were a, pro were, were a problem. Uh, and it was basically a whole of government effort that, that enabled this massive operation to, uh, to, uh, to come together. Uh, and, and a very courageous decision of the prime minister and uh, of the cabinet to, to, to let it go uh, forward. Um, and, and when we went into this, we, we knew that there were many challenges we were going to be faced with, and we continued to uh, uh, we continue to tackle these challenges as we went along. As the Chinese say, you, we were basically uh, feeling the pebbles as we were crossing the river. Uh, so first, first week I went into the field, I found out that a lot of labor, so every laborer that I saw that day had heard about 8171, each one of them. Uh, and I recall speaking to a laborer's congregation and half of them were absolutely silent. And I asked them, I said, why have you not SMS the government? And they said, well, we own mobile phones, but we don't know how to SMS. Uh, and that is when, you know, I, I, I called up all the cabinet colleagues. I stood there and I uh, sent out televised messages saying all volunteers have to come and help them SMS. Then we found out that they, a lot of them did not have credit on their phone. So we went to the ECC, we, 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 we got approval for, for a waiver there. Then the retailers who were working with us told us, this is a very difficult environment. You're, you're hurling us out of our houses. You're pulling us out of our houses. You have to waive off commission on the 42 rupees commission on the 100 rupee that, uh, you know, that, the, uh, that the partner banks gave us. So on the go, we had to get uh, the sales tax wave off. We had to get the advanced income tax waived off. And there were permissions required from ECC and from the cabinet and from, uh, from all the five provincial, from all the four provincial governments. It was a very, very complex task to turn around. Then we discovered that, that we were confronted with lots of cyber attacks of various sides, sizes and shapes. So there were different agencies involved to uh, exercise vigilance on that. There were issues related to uh, biometric failures that we had to resolve with our partner banks. Um, I recall the first week when I was on radio responding to requests, uh, there was a girl who called up and said, uh, I have received a message that my father is, should receive money, but my father has actually died. Um, and, and I had to explain to them that there are limitations of data-driven messaging. So if your father's death has not been registered in our database authority, I have no way of knowing uh, that, that he has actually passed away. And if our algorithm tells us that he's the one who's eligible in your system, uh, he will get the message. So this had to be all these limitations of the system, all these, uh, uh, all these details about where to collect the money from, what does a KYC mean? How do you do a biometric? How do you line up in a bank? It was a massive, massive operation uh, done for the first time, covering half the country in a context of extreme uncertainty. Um, uh, it, it, and it was an enormous privilege to, to, be, the, to be the face of it uh, at that time. So um, in terms of what we've learned, I think that to the extent of uh, my ministry, it's basically uh, change the way we will uh, we will run government. It's made us more agile, more data driven, more experimental, more ambitious, uh, and that trend uh, is is continue is going is on an upward trend. So I think that's the first thing that SAS Emergency Cash has has done to to us as a government. It's it's basically taught us that you can be ambitious, that the government can deliver, that the government can leverage these 21st century tools, that it is absolutely possible uh, if you have clean hands, 
it is absolutely possible to tell the masses that there will be problems as you go along, but that it is entirely possible to do things in a very new and novel way. So that's one thing that it's taught us. The second thing that it's um, taught us is that uh, it, it's kind of offered us invaluable experience in delivering a massive national program in a context of complexity and uncertainty uh, with speed. Uh, and, uh, and, and thirdly, uh, in terms of the lessons uh, for, for other countries, uh, basically wherever there are unique identification systems, and pervasiveness of cell phone and internet connectivity uh, and the linkage of those unique identification systems with other databases, it tells, it, it tells us that they, it is possible to run large demand-based programs uh, uh, of that nature. Um, so in terms of the way forward, uh, SAS basically, as you, and, and just to sidestep for a moment, SAS basically was this huge uh, welfare program that, that the prime minister had conceptualized and that the cabinet stood behind, uh, this huge program of social welfare, uh, which, which was by any standards the largest for which special institutional arrangements were made. Uh, and in 15 months, we were not even able to structure it. We were able to roll it out, to, to put on ground various programs. Uh, so uh, the the success of SAS emergency cash is basically uh, will will help us to achieve that dream of a very large social safety net in the country, and I think that is the one thing that we are now focused on. Uh, and the policy discourse is ongoing uh, within, within within the government on what the scale, the the, the, the breadth and depth of that. Uh, post-COVID social protection program is going to be and how we're going to leverage cash transfers uh, more broadly. Secondly, uh, SAS emergency cash is also a step stepping stone to a financial inclusion, which we regard as a very important component of poverty graduation. We, we feel that uh, we are very uniquely positioned to push the needle on, uh, on digital payments and to use this as a means of uh, financial inclusion, especially with a very strong gender component. And currently we're working with the State Bank of Pakistan uh, to, to push the needle on, on that uh, very strongly. Uh, and of course, we're working with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, to, to share the lessons more broadly uh, and then to, to learn from other countries because there are many components and many questions on which we, uh, we, we could jumpstart uh, in many areas by, by, by learning from other countries. So, um, uh, so, so, so I think I'd just stop there and, and, Thank and say what Thank you very much, Sanya. That's really impressive. And, and we'll come back to this issue of financial inclusion as well, uh, as well as the use of technology. So Reza, you know, we want to scale up social protection. There's a big macro hit that uh, you've been managing. Uh, the economy slowed down uh, this year, virtually no growth, maybe a little bit negative. Uh, and uh, you're also in the process of trying to manage a stabilization program uh, with the IMF. So from where you sit, how do you see this now playing out in terms of the recovery and, and uh, uh, also the, the challenges that lie ahead? Thank you, Masood, first of all, for organizing this and for having me on your panel. I have to say that I'm struck that usually when Pakistan is discussed in international fora, and Masood, you and I both uh, used to work for the IMF as well, it's usually not something positive. It's usually because um, some boom and bust cycle has occurred and some issue has emerged. But I'm struck this time around that we there's a very positive story about Pakistan. And I think the credit of this uh, goes first and foremost to the good work that was done to handle the COVID crisis. I think uh, Asad Umar is here and um, deserves a lot of credit for the way that was handled. And second, I think another shining example is the work done by Sanya and her team on providing social assistance. And again, I think one of the very few countries in the world that has uh, number one, flattened the curve so quickly, and second, provided and scaled up social assistance in such a remarkable manner. And this 
crisis, the economic crisis is first and foremost a public health crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. And I think in these things, these areas, Pakistan has uh, demonstrated that it can be the subject of a of a positive story in an in a international seminar. I'll talk to you about the um, economic side of it and how the response was given. And I'll make three points. My first point is that pre-COVID, Pakistan was quite well prepared. And it was well prepared because Pakistan had started in the summer of 2019 on an ambitious economic reform program to tackle issues, very difficult issues that had plagued previous governments. And uh, the credit goes to the prime minister for having taken the bold decision to go ahead with the tough adjustment program to have empowered his economic team led by the finance minister, as well as the central bank and others to take the decisions that were difficult. I'll uh, tell you there were two main problems about Pakistan, the current account deficit and uh, the fiscal deficit. Current account deficit was approximately $2 billion a month that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan inherited. And uh, through a series of measures, including giving the backing for changing the exchange rate system of Pakistan to a market-based system from one uh, which used to be a fixed exchange rate system. That current account deficit before COVID had pretty much been eliminated. So a monthly deficit of $2 billion, historically unprecedented, had been eliminated and the current account was broadly in balance just before COVID stuck. The second key problem that Pakistan had always had was a fiscal problem. We had a large fiscal deficit and uh, a public debt burden that was growing. And again, due to the very, very uh, strong, uh, ambitious, tough, uh, well-managed reforms in the Ministry of Finance, our revenues began to grow uh, between uh, August and uh, January, uh, August 2019 and January 2020, in the range of 15 to 25 percent, well above nominal GDP growth. And our primary balance was in surplus for the first nine months of the fiscal year after several years. So both the uh, reduction in the current account deficit and the improvement in the fiscal deficit demonstrated that Pakistan had begun to implement a reform program. It had moved forward on addressing these two main issues. And that is what allowed us to be well prepared, Masood, to give an economic response when COVID struck. Now, just to illustrate the fact that we had made an improvement in these uh, fundamentals, I want to show to you if you can see uh, the chart that will hopefully appear on your screen, that uh, what uh, we were able to accomplish before COVID uh, through the current account deficit reduction, as well as the fiscal reforms, was a very Im significant improvement in the foreign exchange reserve situation of uh, the country. One metric of how well prepared a country is to give an economic response. And on this um, slide, you can see in light purple, uh, the state bank's reserves on the balance sheet. And you will see that from beginning around the summer of 2019 till about February of 2020, a very noticeable increase in the foreign exchange reserves. At the same time, uh, people who follow Pakistan know that back in the summer, Pakistan had a big short position on its forward book of close to 8 billion. And you will see that that short position was also very significantly reduced in the run up uh, just before COVID. And this is just one measure of uh, Pakistan being well prepared. The second way in which you can see Pakistan being well prepared, this is the uh, change in stock market uh, prices up till the 15th of January 2020. So before COVID, and you'll see that as those reforms were beginning to resonate, Pakistan was being appreciated in the markets for its reforms. And similarly, the business confidence, which had uh, you know, shrunk quite rapidly in back in the summer of 2019, had begun to improve. So this was the situation pre-COVID, a uh, situation where we had built some resilience. And then came COVID, and we had to take a number of measures. The government, first of all, under the leadership of the prime minister, and then with the economic team being led by the finance minister, announced a very comprehensive package. It entailed, of course, funds for the uh, SAS emergency cash program that Sanya spoke about, an acceleration of tax refunds uh, that put liquidity into the system, commodity financing operations that put liquidity into the rural areas. I'll talk a little bit about what the central bank did. And uh, the first uh, measure uh, was to reduce interest rates. We had had to raise them as part of the adjustment program. 
But when COVID struck, recognizing that this is an unprecedented shock since World War II that uh, we are having to deal with, there was a need for a very aggressive action. And aside from Argentina, I think Pakistan's uh, policy rate cut is the largest across emerging markets. While giving such an aggressive policy rate cut, we also had to be careful as a central bank that the exchange rate situation remains broadly orderly and uh, some depreciation of the currency, recognizing that it's a market-based exchange rate is of course okay, but very sharp depreciations would create market uncertainty. So while giving such a big policy rate cut, we also uh, wanted to have a have an orderly movement in the exchange rate. And this shows how much major currencies in emerging markets have weakened since the beginning of COVID. And at the very top, you have Brazil, which uh, depreciated 22%. And at the very bottom, you have Vietnam, which uh, between January and September has largely remained unchanged. You'll see Pakistan is right about in the middle. And so the key challenge that we had was both to give a monetary uh, response as well as to keep the exchange rate broadly orderly in our response. If you look at the total amount of support provided to the cash flows of uh, households and businesses, so this is a concept in terms of how much net savings got generated due to the measures taken by the central bank. First of all is simply the impact of the reduction in interest rates. This is simply the interest savings that have come about on an annual basis because of the interest rate reduction. But second in red is um, a program for a deferment of principal loan repayments. This is, a, this is a deferment that's not mandatory, but done by banks on a case by case basis. But we worked closely with banks to try to come up with a system that they would sympathetically look upon the request from borrowers to extend and defer their principal repayments on their loans by up to one year. That measure by itself saved 650 billion rupees that would, other, that would otherwise have to have been paid. And also 92% of the beneficiaries of this were micro borrowers, borrowers from microfinance institutions. Together with this was an incentive package, a regulatory incentive to also uh, give some incentive to banks to agree on a restructuring of interest payments with those borrowers where the banks thought that the problem was one of liquidity and not of solvency. All of these measures were designed to prevent liquidity problems from turning into solvency problems, assuming that the crisis was temporary and sooner or later growth would, uh, would return. Another key measure that was uh, initiated by the state bank was a scheme to protect employment. And um, it was a scheme whereby any uh, corporation that committed to not lay off its workers for three months, and then we uh, revised that to six months, could get concessional financing from a commercial bank that was in turn underwritten by the state bank. Credit risk was with the commercial bank, but we exercised moral suasion by having banks report to us weekly how much applications they were receiving for the scheme and how much they were uh, how much they were approving the gov the federal government also helped by giving a partial risk guarantee for the sme sector and the small corporate sector uh, first loss base guarantee of up to 40 percent uh, which helped to uh, realize that 50 percent of the beneficiaries of this uh, payroll financing scheme were SMEs. And if you look at SMEs and small corporates, 70% by numbers were small uh, borrowers. So you will see that in aggregate, um, we were able to inject about 3.8% um, of uh, liquidity into the system. These are payments that otherwise would have to have been made by the households and businesses. Now, uh, in addition to simply the magnitude of the measures, this is also the number of times that the central bank either introduced a measure or refined a measure based upon industry feedback. And it's plotted against this hill is the curve of new cases that as Asaduma was explaining, we were able uh, to uh, flatten. So this is simply a visual graphic to show that it was a time where um, the economic authorities had to be quite proactive in terms of not only introducing measures, but also revising them in light of the feedback from the industry. So then, um, so my second point was uh, about um, the uh, response that was given, a timely response. And I want to now end with uh, talking about um, what is the outlook. And um, 
you know, as I was talking, uh, fiscal deficit is one key area uh, of concern. When we were giving a response, we also didn't want to give such a big response that we deplete our buffers. And this chart is meant to show the pre-COVID fiscal path and the post-COVID fiscal path, both in terms of the balance and the debt. And you will see that there is a small deviation, but under a scenario where we resume growth, that deviation is expected to be temporary. Similarly, while the level of public debt is high, it's good to remind that Pakistan's structure of external debt is actually quite favorable. And this is a chart that um, shows on the horizontal axis external debt in percent of GDP. And on the vertical axis, it shows the share of that debt that is short term. So if you're closer to the origin, you have lower external debt and a better profile of external debt in Pakistan although its headline debt ratio is quite high, does compare favorably to a number of other emerging markets in terms of the structure of its external debt. Because of, first and foremost, the very comprehensive manner in which the COVID crisis was handled by us and others, you will see that now our business confidence is uh, returning. Uh, on the left is uh, the business confidence index from the state bank service, and you will see a very, very sharp rebound and on the right is the large scale manufacturing growth index. Again, you will see a considerable rebound. This is a deeper dive into some of the sectors, auto sales, cement, petroleum, electricity, all indicators for the real economy are now recovering. And finally, in a longer term view, this is the growth projection of Pakistan in green pre-COVID and post-COVID in red. And uh, we are quite uh, hopeful and optimistic that Pakistan can resume the medium term growth trajectory of about 5% that we had expected before uh, COVID. So very, very briefly, uh, Masood, the three points I'd wanted to make was that Pakistan was fortunate to be well prepared thanks to the reforms done before COVID. Second, a timely and a quick response. And third, an outlook that we think is quite favorable to support the recovery going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raza. So we've got a lot of uh, information and uh, perspectives from all of you. And uh, Reza, if it's possible, what we might do is if you could send us a link to your uh, charts, we'll put them up associated with the video of this for anybody who wants to look at them in more detail. Can I turn to you, Calypso? You've been listening to all of this and, and putting it in the context of what you've been looking internationally. Any thoughts, reactions, questions that you want to raise? Thank you, Masood, and thank you to our, our colleagues. First of all, I wanted to congratulate you. I think it's an amazing um, achievement. Of course, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty globally. We don't know what uh, the virus will do next, but uh, notwithstanding this uncertainty, I think uh, the political leadership, uh, technological innovation, and this spirit of perseverance by the leadership uh, and to problem solve and uh, coordinate and try and implement as best given the circumstances actually has meant that Pakistan has been a success story. So many congratulations. Um, if I may, I have one point which has to do with data, data in health. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it's already been discussed to some extent. So on one hand, we're seeing this amazing application of uh, sophisticated technology in the form of uh, smart lockdown, for example, um, where you're using smartphones to collect information from field workers, you're mapping these hotspot forecasts uh, real time against uh, uh, capacity at hospital level, really impressive stuff that's led to, as you described, uh, uh, an ability to narrow down uh, lockdowns. Um, and in fact, I think this is the sort of model that a country like the UK ought to look at, uh, given how hard it's been here in the United Kingdom to come up with an efficient uh, working uh, mechanism for uh, tracing, testing, tracing and treating or isolating uh, people. So that's really fascinating and really uh, impressive. On the other hand, pre-COVID, uh, and, and this is not unique to, to Pakistan, many emerging powers, emerging markets have the uh, same issues. Civil uh, registration, vital statistics systems uh, are relatively weak, especially death registration. We know, for instance, from WHO, the UN Stats Division, there's very little publicly available data. There was before COVID, the COVID crisis on, uh, on deaths in the country. So how do you reconcile the two? Um, and perhaps some thinking on lessons 
um, um, on the future? How can one learn from the crisis, um, as, as Dr. Nishtar flagged already, uh, to improve those vital statistics systems using technology? So it's actually been an opportunity uh, to, uh, to get the data right for so many other purposes moving forward. So that's my main uh, point. Over to you, Masood. Thank you very much, Kalip. So I'll come to Alan, then I'll come to Asad first, because I know you have to leave a little bit uh, earlier, Asad. So, Alan? You're on mute, Alan. There we yeah. go. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Masood. And, and thank you to all our panelists. I mean, this has really been a, an eye-opening presentation, I think. And a lot of countries can learn from what Pakistan has done both on the health side and on the social protection side. I mean, we have been trying to follow countries and compare the way that they've been able to use their assets. They're usually digital assets or data assets to mobilize very rapidly large programs of social assistance. And I think if you look across countries in the world, you know, Pakistan is one of those countries that needs to be looked at for lessons for other countries as well. It is a leader in terms of how it has mobilized these assets. Its ID system, its social economic register, and its record of having made very large transfer programs to refugees, to flood victims, and of course, the Benazir program. So you had something to build on, and I think the way you've built on it innovatively is, is really, really impressive. So as we look at Pakistan, we compare it to countries like South Africa or Brazil or Namibia, which has an innovative program, or even India, we see many, many lessons coming out of Pakistan. And I think you brought out those um, very well. Uh, one question that we've been asking ourselves is how countries are now picking up the pieces to look towards the future of their social protection systems. And you, you touched on this, uh, Sami, at the end of your presentation. Um, and we see that many countries are now looking at what they've done, how they've innovated in their systems, and how they can use that to get better systems going forward, systems that are more equitable, more inclusive, and more efficient. And I'd be interested to know a little bit more about how you see that challenge going forward on learning. And I can think of two or three areas <laughs> that I would like to know more about what is the thinking in Pakistan. One is the whole question of screening. Um, the countries are very successful in getting large volumes of applications for assistance, but then it's very difficult to screen. And in your SAS program, you have different categories. And for example, you have a category three where the screening goes back, it seems, to the local governments. And that, of course, takes time, that kind of screening process, which conflicts with the need for rapid assistance. So how do you see that trade-off between screening and speed? And are there ways that technology in the future can help us to be much faster in terms of getting money to the people it needs to go? Another question is related to gender. And um, there was some concern in looking at Pakistan that uh, women have less control over mobile communications than men. And so programs that get rooted through mobile communications may favor men rather than women. And I'm wondering if you have any knowledge of that, any experience and thoughts on how, uh, if that's an issue and how to address it. And the third is the relationship with financial inclusion. You mentioned this. Uh, a lot of countries have innovated. They've relaxed their KYC. They've used this as an opportunity to bring large numbers of people into the banking and mobile money system. So I'd be fascinated to know a little bit more about what your thoughts are on that in Pakistan. Again, thank you for a wonderful presentation to all three. Thank you very much, Alan. Can I just add one question or, or really it's a thought? I mean, I think to me, the biggest learning from listening to you and from watching what Pakistan has been doing is that, you know, when faced with this unprecedented challenge, the way you were able to bring together technology, 
communications, innovation, and organization to deliver one of the largest social protection programs, you know, up and running in short scale, ability to pinpoint where the virus is concentrated and being able to do these sort of very micro-targeted lockdown. I mean, all this really is quite extraordinary in terms of the ability of government to come together and do this. And I guess my question really is, you know, at some stage, this crisis will pass. But there are many chronic problems in Pakistan where it's precisely this We've not been very successful in terms of mobilizing either organization or technology to deliver the same kinds of outcomes. And, you know, just to think of one, you know, the problem of raising revenues in, uh, and the tax rate in Pakistan, the tax take has been a sort of 30, 40 year old chronic issue. How does one uh, think about taking the learnings and the and the sort of confidence that comes from having mastered this particular uh, exercise, uh, this pandemic, and applying it to some of the other areas of governance and governing going forward. I think that would be an interesting issue also to reflect on. So, uh, Asad, I know you have to go first. So could I turn to you to see if you had any final thoughts? I, I'll, I'll comment on what you just said, Masood, and uh, and the first uh, question that was asked about the uh, the data regarding the uh, deaths and, and other other health statistics, and and then I'll be taking leave. Uh, so on the health statistics, the the answer is yes. The the data is not uh, perfect, and and we realize that. And when we were trying to track down the data uh, on the cases. We had uh, developed based on the cyber prevalence work that we had done. We kind of had a, root, a, a multiplier which told us that if X number of cases are being captured, then what the real uh, spread of the disease was. Uh, so we carried out a first uh, a localized cyber prevalence study and then a nat national study. Uh, but the data that we took as more accurate uh, were, was the data related to hospitalizations and mortality. But even the mortality data is not perfect. So we actually drilled down all the way. Uh, we took four major graveyards of Lahore and some of the major graveyards of Karachi. And we had boys going down uh, into the graveyards and opening the registers and, and, and trying to reconcile data. Uh, so, so a lot of learning there. Uh, first uh, learning is uh, it's still not digitized. So that's the, that's the first thing that needs to be done. The second thing is uh, multiple uh, jurisdictions. So you have uh, more than one agency dealing with the reporting of the data. Uh, so, so fair bit of learning and we'll be, uh, we've already made some of the recommendations and uh, hopefully uh, the local governments, because this is devolved decision-making, this is decision-making which is done at the local level. So each city or each metropolitan will have to do the decision-making, uh, but that learning has been shared there. Uh, but on, the, uh, on the, the positive aspect of it was WHO did a study uh, which they put up on their website. And that was dealing with the accuracy of the reporting of uh, the COVID uh, numbers. And uh, in the region, Pakistan was supposed to have the most accurate reporting. And in fact, we were significantly better than UK. I and mean, that came as a big surprise to me, but according to the WHO uh, analysis, uh, ours was considered to be more accurate, but still uh, a lot that can be improved there. Uh, the, uh, the issue on governance that you raised, Masood, is a very interesting one. You know, NCOC, the National Command and Operations Center, has now become a verb. Uh, and, and people talk about taking issues and say, let's NCOC Karachi as an example. Uh, so it's, it's being talked about, it's being written about, it's considered to be a new hybrid governance model for Pakistan. Uh, elements of it are being applied to dealing with chronic issues like the development challenges, which Karachi, the largest city of the country, faces. Uh, if a, a similar governance model is being put into place for a special development program uh, for uh, South Balochistan that is coming in, uh, in, in place. Uh, we were also faced at the same time by an exceptional locust threat. Uh, the, the locust uh, threat in the last couple of years has started to become bigger and bigger uh, for the first time in a quarter of a century. And uh, Mr. Donald Trump really needs to uh, be given a lesson in science on... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, on what the, 
the climate change is doing to this globe. Uh, so again, a very similar model was applied there. So yes, uh, you're absolutely right. There are uh, significant governance uh, learnings, and uh, some of them are already starting to be uh, to being employed. And what we are now trying to do is trying to institutionalize some of these, at least in terms of emergency response. So a new emergency response uh, legislation has been drafted, and uh, we will be strengthening the institution and more importantly the the governance framework. Uh, to deal with emergencies. So that will be hopefully certainly one of the outcomes of, uh, of the learnings that we get there. So apologize for having to rush, but uh, I'll, I'll take leave. Uh, I'm already like a minute late for my next meeting. Thank you for joining us uh, Sir, for, for this discussion. I mean, I can think of many topics on which people should be putting forward proposals uh, that they should be NCO seed uh, in Pakistan. And uh, you've named a couple and, and I'm sure there are others that uh, people would put on the table. And I think an interesting exercise also down the road is to look at what are the pros and cons of having that kind of governance framework? And what does it do in terms of accountabilities and responsibilities for other line ministries and what circumstances you go for that model or other models? And I'm sure people will be doing case studies in public policy schools uh, going forward on that. Uh, Sunny, could I turn to you for any uh, reactions to what uh, Calypso and Alan said and, and any final thoughts? Yes, I think Calypso and Alan had a series of very interesting questions. Uh, the first one is about gender. So very quickly, uh, in the final analysis, when we closed off our uh, assistance, 60% uh, of the recipients were women. Uh, but they're absolutely right that women uh, ha are disadvantaged in terms of access to mobile phones, uh, both in terms of ownership and in terms of usage. So what's currently ongoing within the SAS um, uh, the, the policy arena is to analyze what the best evidence is uh, to improve access of women to cell phones. Is it better for us to buy cell phones and give it to the SAS beneficiaries or should we work with the Ministry of IT to reduce the, to somehow uh, bring policy innovations to reduce the cost of the smartphone handset. So currently that uh, the gathering of the evidence is underway. So that's uh, very quickly the response to the gender question. In terms of your question about financial inclusion and Alan said, well, what's the way forward? Um, all the meta analyses tell us that cash in cash out operations uh, are actually the stepping stone to financial inclusions. So we have in one, in, in one big quantum stride, familiarized 15 million uh, households uh, to, to the banking system. Uh, their KYCs, their lining up, uh, you know, uh, behind counters using biometric was the stepping stone to financial inclusion. And currently the, the payment that we made to them uh, was in limited mandated current accounts uh, because the current regulations allow us to do that, you know, and, and it is the controller general of account, the auditor general, because we have to maintain an audit trail. But going forward, the state bank is bringing quite a revolutionary change in terms of how payments are going to be made in a wholesale manner. Uh, and we will very, very soon be moving to an ecosystem of giving our beneficiaries the options of a, of a savings account. So even before the state bank micropayment gateway is fully installed, which we will be, in which we will be participating, uh, our payment system allows us, um, allows our beneficiaries to use the biometric signature uh, to either push the money into a savings wallet or to withdraw the cash. And now it's a question of how fast the financial literacy interventions are going to impact, which we which are now in the pipeline, and how fast the merchant net network is going to develop. Because if you want uh, people to transact digitally, uh, transact in digital cash, it is not just a question of having the infrastructure to give them the, the, the those accounts and to uh, and, and, and to have the appropriate financial literacy interventions, but also the ecosystem in which they will operate. 
uh, the, you know, the availability of the merchants, the, the market incentives for, for, for merchants to invest in it, the commercial banks to heavily invest in products for them. And we hope that with our moving into that area, the ecosystem uh, will slowly build and at some point we will be able to exploit a synergy. Uh, the third point was about screening uh, from Alan again, and he referred to the five categories. Uh, let me explain to you that the categories that we outlined and which we, which are available on our public dashboard and which I articulated in the report, uh, an interim version of which is in the public domain, those categories were for two purposes. Number one, they, they explained to us the difference between the avenues through which the requests were coming and the administrative pockets in which the financial authorizations were done. So we wanted to give a granular visibility of that. But for practical purposes, all the requests that came to us underwent the same data analytics protocol and the same protocol that checked them against existing survey data. And there was no difference regardless of whether they came in through the 8171 route or whether they came in through the uh, web portal that sat on the prime minister's website. Uh, your question, uh, uh, Alan, was also specifically about the speed of category three, which came from the district route. So I, I just wanted to uh, explain that, uh, th that the districts had been compiling lists because they have the district administrations because they have their feet on the ground and they had been receiving applications. Uh, so we just wanted to provide them with an opportunity to pass on those applications to us in a secure way. But for all practical purposes, the, the, the data algorithms, the, the, the methodology for dealing with all the applications was same. And I've articulated it in a report as well. And since Masood has, uh, has mentioned that there will be an option of sharing uh, other details with this video, I'll be very happy to share uh, the, the interim report with you. Uh, there was also a question about the, the future of so social protection. Uh, and uh, so, so currently, we, uh, we, a policy discourse is ongoing about the horizontal and vertical uh, scale of um, cash support that we will be giving uh, to, 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 to people. And um, let me at this point also outline that SAS is, is a multidimensional program. And it includes a number of different interventions which target different segments of the population. So if there is an entrepreneur who, re who requires a, a, a very small loan for, uh, you know, to, to, to install a push cart, we have a small loan for them as well. Uh, if we have a program that focuses on transferring of assets uh, for, uh, for, you know, for livelihood generation, the, we, the government has brought uh, um, a need and a merit-based scholarship program for undergraduates, which represents a transformation in the scholarship policy of the government to, to make it pro poor. There's a conditional cash transfer program on nutrition, which is a complement to our under unconditional cash transfers. Uh, next week, the prime minister will be uh, uh, announcing the nationwide rollout of our uh, conditional cash transfer uh, program for primary education in which girls have been given a preference and, and so on and so forth. So basically, ASAS has tailored program for different 14 target audiences, and they're all uh, meant to reinforce each other and, uh, and, and exploit a synergy. But the unconditioned cash transfers is, of course, the wholesale large, large, uh, the, the massive engine through which we can re reach out as we have half the, half the country and if need be. Uh, much more. Um, on the point about ex uh, about governance models and best practices and the, and the point made by, I think, uh, Alan towards the end, uh, you know, in Pakistan, the, the, the issue is, and uh, the problem is a problem of execution. And if you can execute with with, with, with very uh, close oversight, with very close disciplines, with, clo with, with routines, it, it's possible to turn around things. And I think that is what we were able to demonstrate in uh, SAS emergency cash. 
Uh, and the, quickly responding to the last point about data and, um, and about civil registration, I think what we've seen in Pakistan over the last decades is, is, a, is a transition because we did not have civil registration systems. Uh, and for decades, our birth and death data used to come from sample surveillance systems. So it was the demographic health surveys uh, conducted cyclically uh, on, uh, on a nationally representative sample that used to tell us about death, death rates, about birth. And then when NADRA, which is our database registration authority, which when that came into being, and it was made conditional for children to have a specific uh, form linked to their births as a conditionality for entering to school, that the uptake of the birth registration increased. And now I think a SaaS emergency cache has been quite transformative in this sense, because people understand that if they're not going to register deaths, uh, the next of kin is not going to be authorized for social assistance from the government of, of, of any kind. And, even, and I think the earlier BISP program was also very powerful in, in, uh, in encouraging millions of women to, uh, to have national identity cards because they understood that unless you're going to register with the government, uh, you're not going to get the benefit. So all of the, uh, you know, the programs of SRS are linked to identity cards. And sometimes people turn around and tell me, well, what about that segment that is left about what about the what about migrant people who do, um, you know who who, who who the stateless who live here and the Afghan refugees and the other who are in pockets of the country and my answer to them is we have to formalize them we have to give them identity cards and only then we will be able to serve them so it has been a gradual but a very positive transition. And I think these new measures that the government is taking, these whole scale, these, uh, these wholesale, very massive, large programs that are pegged to national identities will help to increase the appetite and the uptake uh, of, of formal registration. That's exactly what we all want. Thank you very much, Sadia. I think it's great that you have all these different windows in the SAS uh, program, because if there's one lesson that we're learning already, it's that the recovery from this pandemic is going to last many, many years. It's a long-term marathon over which the recovery will happen. And the real risk is that the vulnerable and marginalized are going to be left behind in the recovery. So having programs that ensure that when families are struggling, the girls still go back to school, that uh, uh, the people who are working at the margin and uh, day workers still have support going forward is going to be a big part over many years. Uh, so thank you for that. Reza, we're running out of time, but any last thoughts from the, the, your perspective? No, Masood, I think it's, um, I think the most important points, I think in this conversation were about handling the public health dimension. Uh, because this is a public health crisis first and foremost. I think there's a story on the economic side, and uh, I'll just leave your audience with the thought that um, had uh, Pakistan not embarked on those uh, reforms pre-COVID, and had COVID struck when our fundamentals were the way they were uh, before the beginning of the reform programs, the economic toll uh, would have been a lot higher so it really was a case where um, you want to patch up the roof before the rain starts. And thank God we had um, done a bit of our work in patching up the roof when COVID struck. And, and now let's hope the rain stops soon uh, so that any remaining weaknesses in that patch up in the roof don't begin to cause problems. Uh, thank you uh, all. Sanya, Reza, Calypso, Alan, and Asad uh, Umar in his absence for participating. We had a couple of questions online, and uh, one of those sort of went over the same issue, which was uh, the need to use this governance model for other problems like uh, climate change, which are having a big impact, as uh, Asad Umar mentioned. Uh, and the other, of course, is that uh, as you move from 
this phase to the next phase of the pandemic, you have to start looking at sort of asymptomatic uh, people who are also either carriers or looking at antibodies. So changing the testing strategy in accordance with the uh, evolving nature of the pandemic. So uh, thanks also to all of you who were joining us online and we will get the presentations and the documents that Sonia Nishter was talking about and, and uh, make those available to anyone who's interested. So with that, uh, let me also thank CDPR, our partners in this uh, in Pakistan for their participation and support and bring it to an end.